Okay, so my project is redistricting, which is a little bit different from pretty much every talk you've heard at the Blue Water Symposium. So I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit how I came onto it. Uh, my co-author is Jan Liu, who's uh, also at NCSA. So my background is in math and computer science, uh, like most people. But uh, the one thing I guess I have that, that's different is ever since I was a kid, I was also always fascinated with this concept of power. Power meaning how is it that uh, in a human society we can organize ourselves into governance structures. So um, that some people, you know, where some people have power and other people do not have power. So you have all these humans in some country and somehow you organize yourself so some of us have power and some of us don't. I'd be one of those without power. But uh, so th th this, is, this is something that uh, sometimes when you explain to other people how other countries govern themselves, it's also very interesting. So for instance, I find it very interesting trying to explain to my kids how uh, North Korea works and why everybody there thinks of that as a legitimate power structure and why that, that hasn't been overturned. It's, it's an interesting um, idea. So this project, it's about redistricting, and the, I've been fascinated with redistricting for a long time because it determines power. So if this is a really simple example, you can think of this map one as a state. There's a bunch of Republicans and a bunch of Democrats. Map two draws them into four districts. So the dark lines show you the districts. So that one has three Republicans. This one has two Democrats and a Republican. This is two Democrats and Republican. That's two Democrats and Republican. So even though there are uh, the same number of Republicans and Democrats in the state, after you put them into districts, if they were to elect representatives in those districts, it'd be three quarters Democrat and one quarter uh, Republican. On the other hand, if you go to map three and you redraw the district lines this way, having not moved anybody, everybody's in the same place, you, you draw the district lines this way, you now have Republicans with a three quarter uh, advantage over Democrats, which are now uh, have only one district out of the four. Or you could redraw it this way, uh, and then you'd have half Democrats and half Republicans, uh, two districts for each. So no one's moved here. Everybody's sitting in the same spot. No one has changed their vote. The Republicans are still voting Republican. The Democrats are still voting for the Democrats. Uh, but it doesn't matter who you vote for because it's not who you vote for, it's whose district you're in. It's who picked you for their district, not who you're picking for your representative. That's already been determined after uh, redistricting. So that way redistricting determines power. And we've been well aware of this uh, practice this issue for a long time. We have laws in place to prevent gerrymandering. We don't do it very well because even though we have some laws in place, it keeps on going. So there are legal constraints, but it's not very constraining. One of the results is that US elections are largely non-competitive. And what does that mean? It means this is a, a plot for the US House of Representatives. 435 members every two years, all 435 members go up for re-election every two years we re-elect well over 90% of them. They're not competitive elections. These guys go in office over and over again, unless there's some kind of scandal, we just re-elect them. Do we like them? We don't really like them, we hate Congress. Real, uh, job approval rates are really low, but we put these guys back in office, and why is that? Because they're in districts where they're not going to lose, because they've drawn themselves into those kinds of districts. So one of the things that's interesting is sometimes I talk to my kids about North Korea and I say, well, you know, it's an information thing. They don't have enough information. They're making their, their judgments and their, their uh, decisions based on uh, um, a lack of information. I would say the same thing happens in every country, including the United States. So redistricting, if we take a look at some of the maps, this, uh, the, the district in black is North Carolina's 12th district. It looks a little bit funny. It's 160 miles long. I don't know if any of you are from North Carolina. Does anyone know this district? It follows a highway called uh, I-85 in North Carolina. It pretty much looks just like that I-85. And what happens is over here, this is Durham, this is Charlotte. And what happens is when they see some people they want their district, they branch out and grab them. And then when they're done grabbing all the people they want, they get on the highway. And then when they go down the highway a little bit, they find some more people they want, they branch out and they grab them, they get back on the highway. And so it took them 160 miles to find all the people they wanted to get uh, a district. So that's North Carolina's 12th. This is Louisiana's fourth. Um, this one goes through 28 parishes in five of their largest uh, cities. Looks like the entire state of Louisiana. This is from my home state of Illinois. 
This is Illinois' fourth. We call this one the earmuff district for the reason you probably could already figure it out. Uh, it's got a bunch of people there, a bunch of people there. What's going on over here? Well, what's going on over there is, if we superimpose it on a map, what you see is there's a whole bunch of people down here. There's a whole bunch of people over here. There's actually no people anywhere in this area. So this is a railroad track. You can see that. This is a 294. So they came back over here, got on a railroad track, came down 294, went through a cemetery, forest preserve, came back over here, found some more people. <laughs> went and got their other people. The people in the middle, we didn't want them. They aren't in the district. They're in a different district. This one is my personal favorite because it looks like a cow falling off a horse. I'll give you a couple seconds to visualize that. The horse is up on its hind legs. That's my favorite. Ah, uh, this one is a puppy. The press loves these things. They give them names. This one's called the hanging claw. Maryland's third we call the pinwheel of death. So by now you guys are getting good at this. Anyone have a guess for what this one's called? Pennsylvania seven? What? A name? It's Goofy kicking Donald. <laughs> so what's interesting, I think, about these maps is uh, sometimes I show them to people and they think, you know, you've lived in the United States your whole life. Do you have any idea your districts look like this? Most people don't. Uh, most people don't know that we, we give names about Disney characters and animals to our, to our districts. But this, this is the United States, right? And this is, our, this is part of our system of governance. So one of the things I wanted to explore with this project is um, with redistricting, what, what is possible? Because this stuff happens all behind closed doors. Legislators you know, devise these districts and then legislators pass them. They don't talk to you about them. They don't even show you the pictures. It's a little bit embarrassing. No one wants to show you a, a, a picture. Um, but you don't know if these maps are bad unless you know what is actually possible. Is there something better that's possible why are these maps drawn uh, they w the way they are? This is actually an idea I had 30 years ago when I was an undergraduate. Um, and I wrote uh, a program for my, my, uh, my undergrad thesis that explored what would be the impact of various laws if we passed them on redistricting. How would they actually constrain the process? Could we actually constrain the process in a meaningful way? Um, we didn't have a lot of good computing power 30 years ago. That would actually was, I was actually quite proud of that project. But 20, uh, 20 years ago, um, a little over 20 years ago, when I became a professor at the University of Illinois, I was still thinking about this idea, and I wrote a program that basically was a, a not as well-formed idea as this one. And I let that one run for a while, and it produced all sorts of output, and I was watching, and I was like, well, I, I think I wrote that right, because it looks like it's producing the right output, but it just wasn't going anywhere. And after uh, a, a long time of watching it, I just had to kill it, and I said, this, this, isn't, this isn't possible. So this is my, um, my every decade revisiting of my favorite computation and complex problems. This is, this is my latest uh, revisiting of uh, this problem. So the idea here is that uh, redistricting is an application of what we call the set partitioning problem, which is NP-hard. So set partitioning basically is you have a whole bunch of units and you're trying to partition it into subsets, right? And that's what redistricting is. So the total number of ways that you can um, say, uh, take 55 units and put them into six districts, 55 units into six districts, is on the order of 10 to the 39th. Sometimes I give these talk before non-numerate uh, audiences, which you are not, so you know 10 to the 39th is really, really big. Uh, so the number of ways to do this is, is really large. This is a, a real example. This is the state of Minnesota. Um, the state of Minnesota has 87 counties, 1,000 some census tracts, 4,000 precincts, a quarter of a million census blocks, and you have to put these into eight congressional districts. This is a picture of the census blocks in uh, Minnesota. So in every one of these little units, which you can't even see because there's so many of them, we have information about the people who live there. We know who lives there. We know what they're like. Uh, in every 4,000 precincts, we have information on how they vote. We know how they voted in the last long set of elections, um, what race people are, 
We have lots of information, and we just have to divide this into eight congressional districts. So you can see just by the picture, there is an astronomical number of ways to do this. And if you want to constrain this process, it is unbelievably hard to actually constrain the process so that you prevent all the, all the bad things that could happen, as it were. Well, we're not defining bad, but you know what I mean. Um, so there's lots and lots of ways in which we can do that. And so this is our uh, idea of what, what we can do about it. So one of the things I'm trying to do is characterize what is possible, the realm of possibility, what kind of maps are possible so we can actually just understand what, what can be done. We created an evolutionary algorithm to search the space of possible maps. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a visual of this. This is uh, Minnesota again, and these are counties. I'm only doing, we don't work with counties, so I'm only showing you counties because if I show you smaller units, you can't see anything. So these are the counties. We build a, an adjacency structure for it, and we build maps. Um, here we're just seeding a map, and then we're growing it into eight, uh, eight districts. So we have your standard mutation crossover operators that evolution algorithms usually have. Um, and the idea here is a mutation does uh, somewhat small moves, and a crossover is supposed to do larger moves in the solution space. Uh, the solution space for redistricting is very idiosyncratic. It's astronomically large, but it's a little bit weird in that once you are at a place in the solution space, if you just move a couple units, it doesn't really change the map that much. It doesn't change the characteristics of the map. And so you need something like a, a crossover to move you into different spaces in the, uh, in the solution space. So our crossover, one of the crossovers we have is we take two maps that we randomly choose that we found. Uh, we create an overlap region. So we're taking this map and this map and we're overlapping them on top of each other, creating new units. And then the new units we repair into a new map. Uh, turns out that doesn't preserve as much good features of the map as we wanted. So we're currently working on a different crossover. Uh, it's, it's a path relinking crossover. So the idea there is, again, we start with two maps, we create an overlap map, and then we traverse this path in between these two maps by slowly transforming this map into this map. This is kind of the, the process. And hopefully in between there, since these are already good maps, hopefully in between there we find other good maps or actually other better maps than that map. Um, so those are the basic operators. There, there are some other people who tried to do this, um, and this is them, those guys, or PAIR, Parallel Evolutionary Algorithm for Redistricting, and this is actually SIR, this is our sequential one, or ER, um, but the, we didn't run this in parallel because there, 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 theirs doesn't run in parallel. This is us against them, so the best fitness they found we're trying to get to zero is uh, 04. Um, that took this algorithm five hours to find it and then it's ran for a total of 19 hours before we killed it and it couldn't find anything better than that. We beat that in 25 minutes and then this is every half an hour we, we, we kept going, we let ours run for three hours and unlike that algorithm that had this long starving time after you know, it found something, uh, ours kept getting steadily better. So we, found, we find uh, much better solutions a lot faster, a lot more effectively uh, than anything that exists. And this is just a, a sequential run. So none of these could find anything better than what we've indicated before they either kicked out or we kicked them out after you know, 19 hours of uh, running. So we're, we're, we're hitting better solutions in the solution space at, at 25 minutes than they, they get anywhere. Um, so that's our sequential algorithm. There's just one, one running on one processor. So I showed you that solution space. It's astronomically large, right? Um, and there's no way we can actually characterize that space well with that sequential algorithm. So we're running something in parallel. So what we've done here is uh, this is a, uh, our processors each have a sending and a receiving buffer where when they have something to send to another processor, 
they, they stick it in the buffer and then they just go on and do their stuff. So none of the processors have to wait for other processors to do stuff. You just throw things into your buffer. Uh, you go look for the buffer. So right now the way it works is we just, every so many iterations, go check the buffer and then pull something out if there's something there. If there's not, nothing there, we just keep on going. Um, but this uh, method of communication between the processors is very minimal. We tested it up to 131,000 processors, and the, the time we spend on communication is, uh, is, is not very high. If we had to wait for other processors to, to do something and finish, uh, we time that, and that takes about 41% of your, your, your time. So this takes, our, our method of communication is asynchronous, and it takes almost no, no part of your, uh, of your computing time. So we, we, we ran our algorithm looking for better, better maps. Um, and this here, these are, I know you don't know what these are, but basically this is a threshold and the smaller it gets, the better the, the, better the solution. So when the solution is not that good, we can run with 32,000 or 65 or 131 processors. It finds them all about, about the same time. Um, when we get to 3,100, uh, as, as our, our fitness value, we had to use 131,000 processors to even find something in that range. But the, the main point of the plot is, as we increase the number of processors, we're finding better solutions in, in less time. So we're utilizing a lot of processors uh, effectively and efficiently. So what else are we doing? <laughs> So our heuristic is actually a meta heuristic. It also has a diversification and intensification protocol, which uh, I'll explain to you why we need them. So what we're trying to do is not actually optimize. So usually when you use an optimizer, you're trying to find like the best th something. So we're not actually trying to find the best map. There is really no best map. Um, what we're using it for is a vehicle for identifying high quality, independent uh, statistical sample of maps. Because what I'm trying to do is characterize the space of all maps. Um, and once I can do that, then I can understand other things. But I'm not looking for an optimal map. And I already said that. Uh, so what we have to do is to get independence, we, ins we have this diversification protocol. So we have all these processors working, sometimes more than 100,000. And they keep a, a taboo list. So one of the things you don't want the processors to do is duplicate uh, effort. And so once they hit a a particular quality uh, threshold on their solution. They'll query the other processors, and if they're working in the same spot in the solution space, they, they scatter uh, to different places. And that gets me independence, which I need for my statistical sample, because I don't want a sample of maps that aren't independent of each other. They need to be independent. And we have an intensification protocol, which basically means when a processor is looking for maps, and it's been churning its wheels for a long time, it's gone. I think that right now I have it set at 250,000, no, not 200. 250 iterations, if it's gone 250 iterations without finding an improvement, it sends out a message to all the other processors and says, help, I can't find anything. And if you receive a help request from a processor, then you uh, probabilistically um, choose whether or not to help, which means you stop processing wherever you are in the map and you help this other processor where uh, that processor is in, in, in the solution space. And this helps us get uh, better quality solutions because without that, processors get stuck and then they're, they're, they're spinning the wheels. So we throw more computing power at areas of the solution space that, that seem hard to climb. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a, an example of how we're able to use this. So what, what the algorithm does is it generates a very large number of independent, feasible, and high quality maps. And the reason you need that is because humans actually generate really high quality maps. Humans have this unbelievable ability to uh, draw good maps. I've worked with a lot of these people. They know these states like you wouldn't believe. They'll, when they draw the maps, they're talking about, you go down this street, you turn on this one, you go in this one. They, they know the states. And so unless you're comparing maps that are high quality, in other words, like a human would have produced, there's no point in comparing these maps because this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to reconstruct what a human uh, would do. So partisan gerrymandering is, uh, the example I'm gonna give you here. So right now there's a case uh, on, on appeal to the Supreme Court, it's called Whitford v. Gill. 
In 2011, the Republican legislators redrew the districts. In 2012, the Republicans won just under half the statewide vote, but they won 60% of the statewide uh, seats. People thought that was a little fishy. In Pennsylvania, Republicans won just over half of the vote. They have 72% of the congressional seats. In North Carolina, they won 53% of the vote and they have 77% of the seats. So the question is, is, is that true because they're doing a partisan gerrymander or is it true because of something else? So there are other things that constrain redistricting like where the cities are, how the mountain ranges run, where the rivers are. There's all sorts of things that matter when you're redistricting that the court likes to see. And so I'm gonna run a video here because this is better than I can explain it. And it's, someone else already did this video for me. It's a little bit small. My internet's a little slow. Oh, there's no sound. Okay. So what's happening here is we gave this guy a bunch of maps, he made this video for me, and what we did is we ran a lot of maps where we don't use any partisan information. So these are uh, non-partisan maps. And what we're doing is we're trying to understand what a non-partisan map actually looks like. So we run those and we say, okay, does that look like the map that people are suing for? And we create like a billion of these, a lot. Um, no one has actually ever created more than about 10,000 maps. So creating a billion maps is a lot more. So one of the things we do here is we create all these maps and then later we create a lot of maps where um, we use some partisan information. So what we're trying to figure out is, did these guys use partisan information when they were drawing the maps or did they, uh, did they not use partisan information when you were drawing the maps? Because for the Supreme Court, what's important is at what level did they use Sorry. Partisan information. The, um, that didn't work out. Let me see if I can get past this. All right. So what we do is we create all of these maps, and then we have this we have this ability to create. Uh, a, a histogram of what nonpartisan maps look like. So this is a measure of responsiveness, which I'm just gonna fly through. But it's a, it's a measure that uh, political scientists use. So the idea here is, this is what nonpartisan maps look like. How about your map? So this was the 2001 map in North Carolina, and this is the map they drew uh, after that. That's where it goes. That's from the seats votes curve, which I'm not gonna explain. This is a measure of partisan bias, which I'm also not gonna to explain to you, but the idea again is, this is what nonpartisan maps look like, this is where the map was, and this is where your current map is. Um, if we didn't have this histogram, we'd have no idea, right? You, could have, you can have a line, it's like, this is the current map. Okay, I, I, don't know what, I don't know how to characterize what's possible, so I don't know how to understand your map, wherever your map happens to be. You're, we have to anchor it somehow for the Supreme Court to understand, or anyone to understand, what it means to be a partisan map or a partisan gerrymander. This is another measure, uh, competitiveness. So the, the idea here is uh, we've used the power of information and computing in all sorts of ways, and we hear about it all the time. You know, people are talking about physics, people are talking biology, people are talking whatever, but we can also do that uh, to improve our society, right? to improve our governance structures, to help us understand uh, why we govern, why we do, or why we don't. Uh, but it can be used, uh, basically computing can be used in the social sciences in, in very productive ways that no one is really exploring right now. Okay, now I'm done.